Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. What's your favourite live album? Ah, well, that is a... We're opening a can of worms here, aren't we? We are, really. What do you think makes a good live album? That's a really good question. Um, do you know what? There's one, actually, that's become a recent real favourite live album, which Don Beacon turned me on to, which is Secret World, which is the Peter Gabriel uh, ah. live album from that, which is amazing. But, I mean, I'm obviously... And I would have thought you would be close to this one as well, was, like, live at Leeds... Live at Leeds, of course. I think what makes a good a good live album is the energy from the audience as well. You know, sometimes you get those sort of where they take everything out. Didn't didn't uh, Phil Manzanera's uh, solo project? They took all the audience out. Do you remember what was that? Eight, the, oh, eight oh one, eight oh one, and you can't you can't hear that vibe. What? So I like. No, I, I, like do, about, I, I think that's more that it was just a Queen Elizabeth Hall audience. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> but what I do like about live at Leeds is the energy that's coming come, well that's in the room there's energy in the room isn't there it's also Pete in his pomp yeah exactly but um, um but we'll get but there's an interesting thing there's a, something that goes wrong sometimes with some things with live up with greatest hits like for instance the one thing I can't listen to on the Peter Gabriel one is Sledgehammer because it's too fast and it's the same with with like with Roxy Music and people love is the drug it's too fast yes. when you're in the room that's amazing and exciting and it works. But when you put it on a record, it doesn't. Yeah, no, that absolutely right. I, grow, I suppose growing up, you know, it would have been um, uh, Rock in the Fillmore, Humble well, Pie. Of course, Slade Alive. Um, Slade Alive. Fram Frampton Comes Alive. I mean, that was, that was interesting with, with and because you've pointed this out before, that 70s thing of there were bands where it, you know, the live is just where it happened. And you, you never captured it in the studio. So I only re ever really knew Frampton Comes Alive. I never really went back to the studio recordings. That's true. That's true. I mean, the Orman Brothers as well, I think. Orman Brothers, that's, that's, I mean, that's absolutely a yardstick. But also, yeah, that's how you know those songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, the, I suppose the one that everyone had when I was a kid, initially, the first sort of live album I became aware of was, was Deep Purple. Um, you live know, in, in Japan. Japan. Yeah, made in yeah. Japan, rather. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know why that became sort of seminal, wasn't it? That one yeah. as well. Uh, but then I, we we mustn't forget. Uh, I made a I made a note of some of these, by the way. Of course you did, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Talking heads, stop making sense. I uh, but that's a film. It's more of a film. That's the more a film. You've got it. Basically, you've got to see it. Yeah, really, and that me. and that show was kind of created as a film, isn't it? Really. Yeah. Um, oh, Rolling Stones, Get Your Yards. Oh, Get Your Yards. Do you know what? That was one of my first real introductions to the Stones. Now, I've got to say, yeah, that, that's a pretty definitive record. Although the Brussels Affair, which was a bootleg and did the rounds for a long time, which they released, I think, via their internet. I, I mean, I don't think you've heard that. It was Mick Taylor playing. I mean, that is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. for me. You know, and they say things like, we've just got a, we've got a new album coming out. We've got some new songs. This one's called Brown Sugar. You know, yeah. you're back there at that moment. And um, and I just wanted a, a David Bowie. What's the favourite David Bowie? Oh, do you know what? Stage. I adored. I love Stage. Totally. I, which gets some unfair press. But no, there's the Live at Santa Monica, which was a bootleg for years and then was right. released. Right. With, with the Ziggy Stardust period. Yeah. And David, yeah. And David, David Dave, Live. David Live, people are Fever, about. Roxy Music. Viva Rocks and Music, and uh, and Johnny Cash falls in prison. I think does that kind of it's more of a social state co a comment. That, though, yeah, that's that? more, more of a, that's yeah, it's more of a documentary type. Uh, you didn't thing. listen to it when you were a kid, did you? Nah, nah, nah. and I wouldn't put it on now to be honest. But um, <laughs> I get its re relevance. In in there's of course another live album we're missing. Well, exactly. I don't know if this is all <laughs> leading up to something. <laughs> Go on, live and dangerous. Yes, Thin Lizzy, of course. Yeah, of you know, course. I mean, what a front cover. Those, that uh, one of the most Kimbo iconic leather images. trousers. Yeah, <laughs> one of the most uh, iconic images. I always felt sorry for Brian Downey because he's the only guy who's not in the shot. Cause he's he, on the back, though. He's on the back. But, and uh, he's the drummer. And he's Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and also, but there's, it's always, there's been a lot of, uh, th there's been a lot of controversy about this album for years, hasn't there? But, about how it was supposedly yeah. very much overdubbed. Well, in the same way that Frampton Comes Alive is apparently very much overdubbed. So I think uh, I think Frampton on this programme actually denied a lot of that. Yeah, and also, I, mean, I remember did. John Entwistle once quipped that apparently on Live and Dangerous, even the audience are from a Stevie Wonder gig. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
<laughs> they're definitely not. No, I mean, yeah, exactly. some of those are Cockney out there going Lizzie. Um, <laughs> so Scott Gorham. Scott Gorham, that guy with those cheekbones and the long hair, I have to say, I think I probably fancied him uh, when I was a kid. No, absolutely. Uh, secretly. And, and he's like with Mick Ralphs, I would say, and the absolute definitive Les Paul Marshall, you know, that rock staple. Absolutely. Should we get him on? Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a party. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah, to yeah, to get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Ah, Scott. Oh, there he is. <laughs> there he is. Well, guys. Looking good. <laughs> Looking very good. Hello, Scott. How are you, man? How's everything? Uh, really, really good. It's yeah. 20 years since I've seen you. Damn. Damn. Has it really been that long? Yeah, it's that long, man. Wow, and you've still got all your hair, you <laughs> I know, and he's got the cheekbones. Well, well, most of it, right, you know, so. <laughs> where did you Where did you two meet? We met, um, I was going to do a, a Lizzie tour, and then things went sort of pear-shaped, and I wasn't well, and da-da-da. Um, but so I spent quite a bit of time. Scott would come down to my studio at the townhouse and hang out, and it was just delightful. Right. I can't say, this man is splendid company. Me, not so much. I always, wanted, I always wanted you in the band because, you, like, you were the primo player and probably still are, you know. So, no. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of gutted that we couldn't make that happen, you know. Oh, mate. Well, there's still time. I know. There's still time. There's well, still that's time. true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, it's been so great getting reacquainted with, you know, with... Um, with all your stuff, because obviously we, we, you know, we're we're tireless researchers, Gary and I. We've been listening through to Scott. We haven't met. I'm Gary. Hi, Scott. Hey, Gary. How you doing, Scott, buddy? Gary. Gary Scott. I'm, I'm glad glad to meet you. Glad to meet you. Such a legend. Actually, you know, being being ill and being in Thin Lizzy are kind of synonymous, aren't they? Really? I mean, you're just one of lots of artists that got sick on and couldn't do the gig. <laughs> That's been Thin Lizzy. <laughs> So you know you were just playing the whole part, guy. Which illness? Which illness are we talking about here? All oh, right, right. <laughs> um, I've had a few. So, so is it is is Lizzie still? It's still happening, right? Yeah, um, I do it uh, periodically. You know, I, I tell almost everybody I I don't use Thin Lizzie as the ATM machine. You know, just because I want a a few bucks to fill up the bank account, I I won't do that. You know, but. Uh, if there's something special, uh, you know, like a uh, an album that's like Life and Dangerous now is you know 45 years old, and I and I want to get out there and kind of celebrate that. Uh, we did it with the uh, uh, Black Rose album, which uh, I almost came a cropper with that one, right? Because with uh, with Black Rose, we had never played the whole album. I mean, I mean, all as musicians, we know that. You, you record certain songs and you know they're never going to see the light of day. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? But, but you record them because you just like the song. Penult penultimate track side two, right? Normally. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those in between tracks, you know. Yeah. But now uh, but now we're doing this, we were, we were doing the, the Black Rose uh, tour, if you will. And now I'm playing songs that we had never ever played live there was a couple of dodgy moments where i thought how, how are we gonna pull this one off you know but uh, but we did so so is there going to be a live and dangerous tour or a one-off i don't know if we're going to call it a tour but uh right now what we're trying to do we're, we're trying to put uh, uh together a whole gaggle of gigs to kind of you know celebrate the whole uh live and dangerous uh, endeavor right because it was a pretty pretty big chunk of our our lives live and dangerous, you know, it was, it's a, it was pretty important, uh, you know, for our reputation and all that. We were, it was so, uh, an album that we were really proud of. So uh, I think it's, 
that is something worthy to to take uh, the Thin Lizzy name out and, and do. Absolutely. In fact, we should, you should do the shows, record them, and then put out live, live and dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> live and dangerous senior, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you've got an eight CD set of live and dangerous come out or coming out. That's right. And 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 with a big booklet and all the photographs and everything. But but it's 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 a sort of completist view of that tour that you compiled live and dangerous from isn't it and oh my god we got the privilege to listen to it there's some amazing stuff on there scott well thank you but you know i do have to say that when uh universal uh brought this idea up of you know live and dangerous was supposed to have been like one night you know in time we we all know it wasn't you know it was a violation of the three out or three nights at uh hammersmith and we had to drag in a couple of other tracks for other live shows we did right and i you know they came to me and said you know we want to put the other three nights together you know and put it out so everybody can can listen to it and i almost immediately said no 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 i'm not into that i i can't see that happen i don't know why we're doing that life and dangerous was what it was right that was like two years ago and then uh last year they came to me again and said you know we've We've just li- watched the uh, the BBC documentary uh, that you did, where uh, Tony Visconti was saying that seventy uh, percent of this album was overdubbed, right? Which <laughs> I mean, it, even to this day, both my myself, Brian Downey, and Brian Robertson cannot believe that you know Tony would have said something like this because it just it just isn't true, right? So the, the Universal people said, you know, we, we've listened to the tapes and, you know, we've realized there's no way that you guys could have overdubbed uh, even 50% of this album, right? Which, if I'm going to be honest, probably about maybe 25% had, we just had to put some overdubs on it because things went wrong as they do live, right? But uh, as the years went on, it seemed to go in five-year increments, you know, Tony would say, uh, yeah, it's 40% uh, overdubs. And five years later, it was, yeah, it's 50%. You know, five years later, it's like, yeah, it's 60%. You know, it kept going up. So <clears throat> we got to this BBC documentary, and all of a sudden, magically, it was 70%. Right, right. right. And he got so, the quote. Um, <laughs> so Universal said, you know, we, we need to put this to bed, you know, because they're all fans of Universal, Thin Lizzy. Let's put this to bed. Let everybody, you know, see and listen and hear, you know, the original things on the night and and show everybody that there's no way that these overdubs could even have taken place. Well, for a start, well, a, why do you sorry. think he would be saying that? Sorry. Yes. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been told that he, Tony will kind of big things up, you know, to enhance himself, you know, a little bit, right? But, you know, with me saying this, you know, I, I love Tony Visconti. I, I really do. I, I love working with him in the studio. Uh, I would still work with him in the studio at, at any point. He's, he's one of those guys, brings a kind of a bright spark in, into the studio. If you're running into trouble, yeah, they can sort it out for you. Uh, there's a calmness in the studio with him. So, it, But it's just this one area that uh, he, he kept going on about. And so... So, so we're we're putting this we're putting this out now, so everybody can judge for themselves. Yeah, because uh, I think what you what, what it proves is you can you can listen to a remix of the original Live and Dangerous as Tony had done it, and then you can also go back and listen to all those tracks plus other versions of those songs taken from other nights in other places, Philadelphia and Toronto, uh, I think, and uh, yeah, and, Canada, and yeah. you sound exactly as good as you do on Live and Dangerous, but. There's also a technical problem with overdubbing stuff. We all know, um, as musicians, you know, there's phasing because you can pick other, you can pick microphones up through guitar pickups, etc. And I know Brian Robertson has got very upset about that and made that statement a few times. Let's just mm. get the backstory on this album, though, because we should really maybe start a bad reputation where 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 Tony comes into the picture and and you're on then you you do that album with Dancing in the Moonlight and then you go on tour in America, right? After that. Sure. Yeah, it, uh, it was a uh, almost like a summer long tour for the, for the uh, album Bad Reputation, and during that tour, we kept hearing Frampton comes alive. I mean, it was huge, absolutely monstrous. 
in America at this point. And every single time it seemed that you turn on the radios, show me the way. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, you know, the little tube thing. You always yeah, the voice box. Yeah, that's right. And it was a great song and it was a good sounding album, right? But Phil turns around to me one day and said, so what is this guy doing to get that audience reaction? I mean, is he turning somersaults or something up there? I mean, what the hell's going on, right? He goes, hell, we could do that. And there was this massive silence in the car of, yeah, we could do that, right? But we had to go to the management. I mean, we had something like, uh, you know, like a five record deal with uh, Phonogram, I, I think it was at the time. And we didn't know, does a, does a live album count as one of your five album deals, right? We no. had idea, right? So <clears throat> we went to the ma uh, management and they said, absolutely. It absolutely uh, is part is part of the, you, you can count that as part of your five record deal. So and then you said, does a double album count as two? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I see so there's three right there. No, so so we thought, okay, well, we're, we're well on our way. Because we needed to show people, you know, what we could do live. We, for some reason, and I've said this for years, I'm not giving any secrets away. We, we could not capture what we did to live on stage in the studio. Other bands could. Uh, and other bands were really successful, like really great, uh, you know, studio albums. Uh, and I think we did produce some good studio albums, but there was that certain spark that was missing. Yeah, but uh, in many ways, though, they're two different things, aren't they? I mean, uh, in the studio, you know, Phil's songs can be quite textural, very you know, delicate. And he seemed to be into bringing in keyboard players and different sounds. And so that was one thing. When you're on stage, it's kind of a sexual event, isn't it, really? Yeah. And, and, it, well, and, and, and you and got the adrenaline pumping through adrenaline, you. And you two guys, you know, are filling all the gaps and playing your, dub, you know, double-headed yeah. guitar parts. And, uh, you know, but but so I think, you know, I, I get that with most bands. I think we know I speak for myself that you're, you're a very different li live and you needed to capture that. Yeah, it, well, we, we did. I mean, with your stuff, you guys always seem to be able to pull it off with, with no problem. I mean, you had hit after hit after hit, and there were that, that are still being played today. You know, <clears throat> if it's not on the radio, it's on commercials and all that. Right? Uh, so you you know what I'm talking about. I mean, yeah, it, and the 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 live thing and the studio thing, they're two completely different animals, right? But nonetheless, we had to show people what, what we did live to. Uh, if nothing else, even generate even more tickets. You know, if you're going to buy a Thin Lizzy ticket, this is what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. There's a great billboard for it. Right? Evidence. And, and it's, and it's that act, that's how it actually worked because the album became a hit. More, even more people came in. So, uh, it's, but did, it, did, so did you have to, you had to trawl through all these, these nights and choose the best stuff? Or was Tony Visconti allowed to, to do that? Did, was that his well, thing? Yeah, because part of this was timing, wasn't it? It was because you were going to do an album with Tony Visconti, but then there wasn't time. And so this was kind of like a, this was to keep everyone happy, I guess, wasn't it? To keep Tony happy? Or... Well, I don't know if it's to keep Tony oh, well, I, I don't know if that's probably a very clumsy way of putting it. <laughs> so, you know, everybody was involved in, uh, you know, the, uh, like the running order. Actually, the running order was we wanted to make it as much, of what you were going to see as, as possible. Like it starts off with the song Jailbreak and then it, it just, you know, goes, goes. I mean, what an opener. That list. What an opener. I mean, that's, I mean, <laughs> you're, you you're, you're, set, you're setting yourself a bar there. <laughs> but that was the idea. This mm -mm. set list, you know, and this is the recording of that, of that set list. Now, <clears throat> uh, on uh, the second night of recording it, I'm the, the, uh, the machines actually screwed up and we lost uh, four or five songs. Is this at Hammersmith? And, and that's, where you, that's where you see us pulling things in from Toronto and, and you know, those kind of places. So we, we had to supplement from somewhere. So Toronto was there and so was Philadelphia. Because what's interesting is because the diff, these gigs, some of these gigs are months apart. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And do you have that? Th you know, there's that thing of when you've had to go back and listen to all of them. There's that thing of, of, of how you play a set at the start of a tour 
And then by the end, it's changed in all sorts of ways, none of which were conscious. <laughs> it's just kind of, it's just different. You go, oh, yeah. And, and the, the, that's why it's stranger listening to the earlys. Earlier sets yeah. in at all. Than That's right. The, and the later, so, do you know what I mean? Because the ending is what you're familiar with. And, right, and sometimes Did within you? the song, the arrangement changes too. Yeah. Hey guys, I've always wanted to try this. Can we try? Yeah. I think it's going to be, you know, maybe it'll make the, the song flow a little better, right? Yeah, that sounds good. So yeah, and then you keep that in. Uh, <clears throat> kind of disregarding what, you know, the, the studio version was all about, you know. It, it's kind of the one thing that, that we did all the time. It just, mm-hmm. we finished an album, we immediately went into rehearsal and then changed everything. <laughs> what, what comes across as well is that is, is Phil's showmanship. I, oh. I mean, I, yeah, I think he's, he's up there with, with Freddie and, and the best yeah. at engaging an audience and bringing the audience into yeah, the show. The, the, the yeah. chat is fantastic. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you said that because I, I uh, God, I hate to say, but I guess I became a little jaded because I'm I'm with him up there every single night, right? But you know, some of the things he used to come up with, you know, uh, talking to the audience and all that, which they were hilarious. They they made you they just made you bust up laughing, you know, on stage, and you're laughing with everybody else in the audience. So yeah. he had that ability that, say, like a Freddie or or whoever to take uh, an arena situation that's got thousands and thousands of people and he was able to shrink it down. So uh, everybody felt like they were in the, in the audience. They all felt like they were involved in what was going on uh, on stage. And I, that's, to me, that is a real talent to be able to do that. But he can make it musical as well because there's a bit on the new album where, uh, you know, and he, and on the live album where he introduces the band and you all play on right. all bits. And he's he, he can actually make all that sound like it's musical, and then he starts getting the audience to participate. I have to say, Guy, and I'm abs- I've no idea why this happened, and I'm gutted that I never saw Thin Lizzy live, and I never saw the Greedy Bastards live either. And, uh, oh, wow. and I am Bastards so Bastards. upset. Which about is that. which is <laughs> Gary's way of introducing the Sex Pistols <laughs> into the conversation. <laughs> So, because I was going to ask about you, you playing with the Sex Pistols, because Gary saw the Sex Pistols at the screen on the oh, green. Did I? I have forgotten. Have I mentioned that before? <laughs> you might have, but I've got the absolute kicker here because we're sitting here, the three of us, mm-hmm. after my what forty-year career in music, and the first gig I ever saw was Thin Lizzy on the Jailbreak tour at the Victoria Apollo, with my friend Martin Glover, who then went on to become Youth, the bass player and producer. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's why I'm. That here. was the sound yeah. of a ball leaving yeah. the park. That was it. That's I mean. You know, it's funny. It's... Wow. Well, that's see, that's a good point. You you never, when you're up on stage, you never know who's in the audience. You you don't know a lot of times what kind of influence you're having on mm-hmm. like a, a guy or a, or a, a Joe Elliott or yeah. a, or <clears throat> or. Guy, the guy from Iron Maiden and all that—you have no idea because you're just seeing a sea of people oh, up there. Uh, your Bobby Gillespie, but Bobby Gillespie and Alan McGee, their first gig they went to was that same tour. No kidding. Jailbreak tour. Yeah, in- <laughs> and it's funny that you mentioned Joe Elliott because I've been to Joe's house in Dublin, and he right. he's got his he's got his framed ticket wall, so he's got the, all the tickets, all the concerts he went to, ticket stubs back in the early seventies. And I, uh, I, when I was at his house, I was like, I was really jealous of the Thin Lizzy one because I hadn't been. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe my mum wouldn't let me have the money for a ticket at, the, at that time. <laughs> Yeah. I, haven't got my t- I haven't got my ticket. You know why? Because I'm just not that guy. No, no. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> but um, let's. Uh, my ears were ringing for like three days afterwards, and it was like every morning I woke up and they still be ringing, and it was like, wow. You still got a piece. Well, you know the Amazing. reason. You know why that was though is because at that point there was no master volumes on on the Marshall heads. So you consequently you had to right. about up to like eight or nine to get the. Uh, the sustain that you want I, 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 my my ears are still ringing from those days you know so scott but you're not using pedals that's just what <laughs> exactly. i asked Ten- marsha went to the master volume so you could turn it down and still get the same, same were, were, you, yeah. were you were you not using any pedals were you straight into the amp back then it was like very few pedals uh like a, a little phaser kind of thing and, and maybe a wah and all that the the whole refrigerator full of the gadgets and all that that didn't come to for another another few years 
Yeah, yeah. The Pride <laughs> Show rack. Gary, did you use that the, the whole condominium full of? Uh, I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid. Well, I didn't at the beginning. Of you know, he did. I didn't at the of beginning. He did. You know, it was a bit of a. But I, but I did, yeah. Probably eighty three. I had my Pete Cornish, yeah, and I've sworn right. by it. But yeah. And yeah, did you yeah, remember yeah. When, when your rig went down, and your guitar tech sat there scratching his head, <laughs> going, "I have Which no lead? idea." Because probably it was this tiny little wire that was just yeah. screwing everything up. Exactly. Right? Oh, exactly. Listen, when you did the when you when you looked at those tapes, how many were they? Desk recordings? Were they were they uh, twenty four track? What, what do you remember? What they were, Scott? Uh, I, th I think they're twenty four track. Yeah. Yeah. And on a mobile, did you get a mobile down at Hammersmith? We did, right, right in the back of uh, Hammersmith. There, it stayed there for. Uh, I keep wanting to say four nights, but everybody keeps. It was three nights, wasn't it? So it must be three, three nights. Yeah. You're getting like Tony Visconti, aren't you? Just get to five nights next interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's next year. Next year it'll be five. <laughs> And was it the Rolling Stones mobile or one of those sort of famous ones like that? Was it? I, you know, I don't know. I, 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 what was that? There was the Rolling Stones, the Pi mobile, and then right. Ronnie Lane's mobile. Well, wait a minute, Eel Wasn't Pi. It? We did a Eel lot, Pi. Cool. We did a lot of recording at, at Eel Pi, so it might have been their rig the, that we were using. Yeah, I had no idea they had their own. So tonight, I'm, I'm, I'm learning something here. You know. Let's go back, Scott. To, to what well, we're for, we're the rock on tours, Scott. We're, I, right. we're <laughs> we want to find out a little bit about how it all came to pass. Anyway, you know, with you uh, starting out as a uh, you started out as a bass player. I, look, guy smiles at that. He was a bass player who became a guitarist. He saw the light. It was a Damascene moment, I'm sure, when he saw no, the light. But for for a very very noble reason, it, it was to fulfil your right. Yeah, tell to fulfil your friend's potential. Tell us a story. I did. I, in Glendale, California, I started out as a bass player, right? Because basically, because it was the only instrument left that my other friends weren't playing, right? And I think I was 13 years old. We had just seen the, this band at, the, at our local uh, sock hop, uh, and the band was the Original Continentals, right? I have no idea if they were original or not, right? But or continental. <laughs> continental, right? Yeah, but I can remember. I don't. I didn't dance one time. I stood right there, right at the edge of the stage, almost hypnotized. And how do these guys? How does that guy know what that guy's doing? And why would he change when that guy? You know, I like, think that when I'm on stage with Guy and on tour, <laughs> <laughs> still to this day, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Go on. So yeah, the the next day at school. We decided to, you know, start a band, and uh, you know, one of the guys played drums in the school band, and the other, another guy had was taking guitar lessons, and the other guy was a saxophone player, right? Who sang? And I'm going, <clears throat> okay, well, where do I fit in? And this guy named Steve Schroggy, who was the guitar player, says, "Well, you can play bass. Great, man. What's that?" <laughs> <laughs> They yeah. Oh, it's that. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. So um, I started to play bass guitar, fell in love with it, uh, and I'm in love with the bass guitar to this day. You know, to me, to me, the rhythm section is everything. If you start a band and your rhythm st section is crap, you are going to be crap. I don't care how great a guitar player you are, a singer or a songwriter. If your rhythm section is shit, you're going to be shit. Can I? Can I swear? Mm. Yeah, you can swear. Okay, thank you very much. I love swearing. A band is only as good as its drummer. That's the kind of start. And bass show. player. And yeah. Bass player, right? But uh, so I, I did that for about, I don't know, four years. And unfortunately, the guy I was talking about, Steve Schrag, he died in a motorcycle accident. Mm. Uh, his father <clears throat> gave me one of his guitars. And I just started playing. Uh, no lessons, no anything, just by ear, just... Uh, tried to teach myself as much as I humanly. Is that is that how you'd learn the bass? Yeah, yeah. What were well, you listening? You know, what this... were you listening to? What were I'm, you know? Because the, the problem back then is what I found with like trying to go back to old records is you can't even hear the bass. That's no, the real you're handica right. Handicap for the bass players. You're you're absolutely. In fact, the first ba bass pl playing you could actually hear was like on Rain with uh, Paul McCartney, yeah. right? And I thought, oh my God, they've turned the bass into a lead guitar. Listen to that. The guy is brilliant. You know, well, that's because it's sped up. That track, is it sped up or slowed down? Is it? It's one or the other. 
Oh my God, I should know this. Uh, the track was recorded. Or, or stays the same. I can't. It's one of the three. No, 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 it's no. Up, it was recorded down or at the right speed. I think it was. Rec- it was recorded slower. <laughs> well, the, the thrust up. of the conversation here, boys, is all of a sudden the bass was pushed to the front. Yes, exactly. Yes. And I, I just love that idea. But like I said, I was given this guitar, and I started playing it, and I loved it, and I realized there was so much more now. I could. I could. Uh, learn and do and be, be a little bit more musical about it. And I kept that up for about, I don't know, four years of just kind of sitting in the back room there. And uh, and then I found myself in England. <laughs> yeah, didn't you get invited over by... Um... Well, I, well, I missed over a lot of stuff there, didn't yeah, I? But, but, yeah, you certainly did. I'm, I'm guessing that's the stuff you wanted to miss over. <laughs> Scott, did you get invited over? Because there's a nice little rock and roll connection, isn't there? Because Bob yes. Sie- Siebenberg... Uh, who's the drummer in Supertramp? He was in yeah. your band, or and he came to England and invited but, you. Bob and I, we we literally grew up together in Glendale, California, and uh, it was, it seemed to be in everything that we got together with. It, it was only he and I that were actually really serious about wanting to be musicians. Right? Everybody else were like weekend warrior kind of things. Guys, I got to bag groceries at the shop here kind of thing and we were going hey, what are you talking about you know come rigs on, of dad yeah Rick, that's exactly <laughs> so, what i was thinking <laughs> so he, he gets married to my sister she wants to go to england i forget the reason he goes over there with her uh and he gets a, a job with a group called bees make honey oh my god yeah yes, famous pub yes, rock yes, group yes, yeah, yeah 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 bees yes. make honey okay and that was a kick-ass band yeah. too my god uh, Barry, the the bass player, you you remember him, guy? I don't know. I can't know. I remember Barry says they were man, the sound that he got out of his cabs, man, were just ungodly, right? So anyway, <clears throat> a couple of the Super Tramp guys came down to the Bees Make Honey gig, saw Bob play, asked them to join the band, right? So he quits Bees Make Honey, goes and joins Super Tramp. They make a demo, right? So now it's a time where, you know, uh, you know, Bob's got to come back to America because his visa is up. Hey, man, come on, stay a couple of weeks with me. So he comes over, stays with me. He goes, you got to hear this tape that I brought over from uh, that we made in Supertramp. It's unbelievable. These two got Rick and Roger. They're just unbelievable songwriters. Right? OK, so I listened to it and I re- quickly realized that Super Tramp are like leaps above where Bob and I were, you know, uh, in songwriting and playing and the whole deal, right? And then he says to me, you know, uh, Roger Hodgson, who's the guitar player slash singer, keyboard player, he, he doesn't know if he wants to play all of that or or just sit down at the keyboards and sing, you know? So, you, you know, they might be looking for another guitar player. You know, what do you think, you know? So I, I listen to the tape again and think, yeah, you know, I could handle that. I, yeah, man, that sounds good to me. And, and what a what a great opportunity, you know? Uh, obviously by this point, you know, Super Channel hadn't had any hits or anything, but you could, you could see the quality, the yeah. sheer quality of these guys, right? So he goes back to England. I, takes me a little while to work up the plane ticket. I finally get on the plane. I get to England, oh, only for Bob to say, "Well, Rogers decided he wants to do it all himself." <laughs> so, yeah, I was thinking I didn't hear any guitar on that track. Here, yeah, here, here, I, I'm here in England, and I don't know anybody except for Bob and my sister. Don't know any musicians at all, and I just turned into another person, completely different person. I would go to pubs. Remember back then, every pub had a stage, right? Mm-hmm. What year are you talking about? Yeah. 70... Oh, this is 1974, right? 1974. So, yeah, so, I mean, you could play, we can go into full pub. pub yeah, it's this Brinsley Schwartz it? period, isn't du- it? Brinsley Schwartz, Ducks Deluxe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know Brinsley. Flyers. Yeah. yeah, no kidding, no kidding. So, like I said, I became this different guy, and I would walk up to whoever seemed like the lead guy, right? And I would say, hey, is there any chance of sometime me getting up here and jamming with you? Which is something I would have never have done in Los Angeles. But I figured, hey, nobody knows who I am here. I'll get on the plane and they'll forget all about me. It's not a problem, right? 
And more times than not, the, these people go, yeah, man, come on down next week, bring your guitar with you. And I would get up there and I, I do that. So, and I, it was purely so I could meet other musicians, right? Which I quickly did and started poaching guys from different bands. I know it's not a cool thing to do, but I started poaching these different guys, started my own band, which is called uh, Fast Buck. And we got these three or four residencies uh, all around the, you know, the London area. Where, 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 where were your residencies? Uh, one was at the Golden Lion in Fulham. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a, a one in a Bermondsey that we had, one out in, I guess, not, is Twickenham? Yeah, in Twickenham. We had one out there, and I can't remember what the other one was, right? But the, the crux of the story here is the saxophone slash keyboard player in Bees Make Honey used to come down to these shows that we did because I would say over the microphone because I wanted to meet more people. If anybody wants to get up here on stage and play with us, we're here next week. Bring your sticks, your 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 guitars, bass guitar, come on up and we'll, and we'll have a jam, right? And uh, uh, a guy named Ruin O'Loughlin from Bees Make Honey used to come up all the time. And on one night he said, you know, <clears throat> I know this Irish band that uh, they're, they're looking for a, a guitar player. Do you, uh, do you know anything about Irish rock? And I, and at that point I had never heard the phrase before Irish rock. And of course I went, Oh, hell yeah. You know, I know everything. <laughs> yeah. Not a problem. I'm all man. over that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Jeez. You need to ask, you know, <laughs> 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 he goes, well, okay, I'll, I'll give the uh, management, I know the manager, I'll give me your number, they'll give you a call, blah, blah, blah. And that's what they did, and I went down and got the job that day. But yeah, hang on, was, yeah. hadn't Whiskey in the Jar had already been out? And Whiskey in the Jar had been a hit, right. and when they yeah. were a three-piece with Eric Bell, right? That's right. Well, yeah. it, Whiskey, see, that was the problem. <clears throat> I had no idea who Thin Lizzy was because the song Whiskey in the Jar had uh, come and gone. And it had been gone for, you know, quite a while. And it wasn't a hit in the States, right? No, at all, right? And but so they weren't being writ written about. The, the songs weren't being played on the radio. So I had no chance to figure out who these guys or even hear of them, right? So I, it was kind of an advantage, really. Uh, there was no, I wasn't overawed by anything yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or anybody that was, that was who, in the Who band. played the guitar on that single? Was it was it, was it it Eric Bell or, or Gary Eric Moore? Oh, here's Eric Bell. Thank God you didn't get the job with Supertramp. Yeah. Because, right. Because, right. Yeah, because no matter, you know, yeah, they want to be huge, but you would have been to, playing a smaller Side part man. than anyone in the band because yep. that's that's how it was being envisioned. And we wouldn't really know who you were. Well, right. You know what and, I mean? You'd be I'd that guy who plays guitar in Supertramp. Yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. and no, no disrespect for Supertramp, but I wouldn't have learned half. Uh, of what I learned uh, with playing with Phil and, and the guys, right? And what a waste of such a glorious rock star persona. <laughs> yeah, what a waste of hair that would have been, uh, right? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So, <laughs> they might have made me cut my hair for God's sake. Uh, oh, God, tell us what that day was like tail. when you met Phil. What, what was your first impression of Phil when you walked into that audition? Well, nobody told me that he was black straight off the bat. And as I, as I was walking down the hall to this uh, uh, a African dinner club, it was called the Oroco Club in Hampstead, I just heard somebody go, so are you Scott? And I turned around and there was this really tall black guy, right? And I thought, you know, I, I thought, well, okay, he's probably working with the, the African dinner club. <laughs> and he's sent, been sent out here to take me into the rehearsal hall, right? To meet the Irish and, and I said, I'm Scott. And he goes, oh, it goes great. I'm Phil. You know, I'm the singer. I went, no shit. Man. Oh, amazing. And he had this big, huge grin on his face. Uh, and he said, come on in. Let me introduce you to, to the other guys. Right? And, so, you know, we walk in and I, and I see both the two Bryans, arms are crossed and they're looking at me going, oh, God, Because Brian's already, Brian have? Robinson's already got the gig, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. He's been there. Two, he's a veteran. He's been there for two weeks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I go in to meet these guys, and, and I can't understand why they're they're so standoffish, right? You know, what's the deal here? You know, 
apparently what had happened is I was I was guitar player number 25 to come in and audition for the band. And all they thought was, well, here's another one we're going to hate. We're just going to kick them out in the street, you know. <laughs> Actually, I, I got through the, uh, the audition. What was the audition? You know, I should know that. Uh, Breakfast I, in so America. <laughs> yeah, dreamer <laughs> right oh my god <laughs> i actually know that one um I, some of it was just the three chord blues kind of thing right. and i remember at one point uh, phil turns around to uh, robo and says hey teach teach scott such and such right so he blitzes through it really quickly and i'm uh, desperately trying to you know catch the chord patterns And he says, you got it? I went, well, he goes, let me go through it again. He goes, bang, 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 bang. And then we take a break. And then the middle eight, it's, you got it now? Uh, yeah, okay. And my eyes did not come off of his fretboard for the next four minutes, right? <laughs> He would make a chord change. Bam, I was right behind him. Bam, right behind him again, right? So man, I think maybe that might have been impressive that I would I could fake it so well. <laughs> But this isn't pub rock, though, because what what they're what they're doing is something a little bit different, isn't it? This, I mean, obviously, we all know what what Thin Lizzy went on to inspire. You know, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Def Leppard, everybody. You know, we all wanted to be be Thin Lizzy at one point. But but where were they getting their ideas from? Where was Phil getting his ideas from? Well, he loved Van Morrison. There's no doubt about that. He loved his the, the lyrics, the phrasing, the way he sang, everything. Uh, he was also a massive Jimi Hendrix fan. Uh, Jeff Beck, which, well, that's really terrible, isn't it? The word, the yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Um, Did you meet Jeff? He was a huge, he was a huge guitar fan. Phil was right, uh, and the reason he, but the reason he got two guitar players in the band was when Eric Bell quit halfway through like this, this Christmas show. So Phil being the guy he is, said, no, nope, we're going to carry on. We're, and which is, I think it was the first drums and bass thing that ever happened, right? Because they just kept on going. <clears throat> and he said to himself, that's never going to happen again. If one of the guitar players falls out, I still have another one and we can keep carrying on. That's why there were two guitar players that in case one quits time. on stage. <laughs> At the time, Talk that about was belt a, a main... Yeah, yeah. Why did what you're saying? Because he loved guitar, and he clearly did things like Warrior. Is is and what's funny yeah. is is when you hit when you, once you realize that Warrior is written about Jimi Hendrix, hmm. it's it's the track is so Hendrix. It's so, a different meaning, right? Yeah, no, but but it, all the riffs are so are so Hendrix. Oh, right. You know, I'd never really really clocked that before. But um, but why did he play bass? Do you think? Especially as he's going to sing, and as we and I you know and I've I've learned those songs. Singing and playing those parts is not easy. No, no, and that's why uh, he, he loved to pedal that E, right? Yeah, Just yeah. That E, right? And, and when I would come to him and say, so I got this really great riff that we can play in this song, and he, he'd look at me and go, uh, right? Uh, he says, you do know I have to sing over all of this, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. And then we'd have to simplify it down because uh, he figured his main job really was to communicate with the audience yeah. right not not to show off how what a fabulous bass player he was and actually he was a he was a pretty damn good he bass. was a great bass i mean player. and you could say this he was a brilliant say bass player the same thing right, about but he wouldn't tell anybody that sting. Yeah. He, he would he would always put himself down as, as a bass but, player but, right? but you know sting and paul mccartney both who sing and play bass you know they're both incredible bass players but they put right. their performance first don't they and it's uh Yes. So it's not right. like a guitar player who sings who goes from singing to guitar to singing to guitar, you know. Well, I think a, lo a lot of people don't realize, and I'm, I'm telling you as a bass player who has to sing sometimes, is that there's a really weird thing. Singing guitar, singing and playing guitar is completely intuitive. It makes, and mm -hmm. even if you're, it's the same part, there's something about bass playing that's completely different. You have to learn all of it. Yeah, it, because it, you're it, always on the move. Yeah, that's true. Bass players are always on the We move. We can play a chord. They're they're the guys that are keeping it down for you, right? Yeah. They're keeping you in line, right? Or the guitar player can hit a chord and have a cigarette at the same time, you know. 
kind of thing. Yeah. You know, you can take breaks. <laughs> you know, the bass player and drummer, they can't take a break. You know, they're they're always working. You know? When so, when did you thank you, Scott? Thank you. When, when did <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know to the guy, I'm a true believer, like I say, in the whole rhythm section. I yeah. am I'm right there with you, man. But that it was really the main reason why we we never got really overcomplicated on, on the bass side for Phil, so he could actually, you know, uh, it left him free to, you know, entertain the people and, <clears throat> and talk with them and communicate. Yeah, but you know what? Them. I wonder if him playing those eights, you know, that because he because he's got to sing at the same time, is what inspired another Irish band that constantly plays those eights on the bass, <laughs> which is U2. Who's you that? know, yeah. U2. Who are we talking U2. about? U2. You know, oh, Adam oh. and just that's their style. And, you know, you wonder if, if that that obviously could easily have come out. When did when did you and Robbo discover that twin guitar harmony thing, which became such a trademark for you and has gone on to, you know, every band has copied it? It, it was kind of uh, straight off the bat only because the uh, songs in the beginning kind of demanded it, but it was very sparse, the uh, harmony guitar. I, I think the time that it really hit home was... Uh, I think it was on the, the fighting album and Robbo went out into the studio just to record a single line. And I think he was going to double track himself, right? Press the record button. He starts to play it, but the uh, engineer had, had it, uh, well, he had a delay on it, right? That was a, a certain amount of delay that when it fed back, it fed back in harmony, right? And of course, the engineer was horrified. He's going, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry about that. I, I forgot all about that." And, and I'm going, "No, no, wait a minute. That that was really cool. You know, that was not supposed to be a harmony line at all." And that kind of made me realize that we could actually start introducing all these harmony lines in a lot more places than than I had realized that we could. Right. So that's exactly what we started to do. I, I even said on the next line, I said, "You know, I've got a line here." Uh, and I brought Rob over and said, this is the line. You want to work out the harmony to that? And he did. And we, that was us kind of up, up, up and away, you know, on the, you know on what, the harmony. You got, got, I, I heard, sorry, Gary, yeah. because I, I heard another, I heard you on another podcast, Scott, and you were saying how, but then when Gary Moore came in, that kind of went up a gear again. And then, you oh. know. Some of the exponentially, yeah. exponentially, right? Because I think that you go, how about we do this? Because <laughs> that's it. You just <laughs> harmony. I'm like, sure, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea, right? What <clears throat> Gary kept me on my toes. Do you know what, though? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. fundamentally very Irish folk music, isn't it? Uh, you know, you can imagine yes. a, a fiddle and a mandolin doing that same sort of thing in Irish music, and you know, and, exactly and Phil right. had that. Uh, let me just say, I'm guessing this is before the, the Hotel California twin guitar part. I think this is before then. Um, now that was Ooh, 70. I know what you're saying. But it's very, it's a very Irish kind of thing to do. And, and, and Irish folk music was always really apparent in Phil's writing, wasn't it? Even oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, Phil was probably the most Irish person you could ever meet, right? And my biggest fear every time we went in, especially in America, when we, because it was always he and I that did the interviews, right? Whenever we went into a uh, an American radio station, I was always in fear for the journalist or the disc jockey that if you got one, <laughs> if you got one thing wrong about Ireland, Phil would, be, Phil would go, no, 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 wait a minute. No, you see, you got that wrong. See, this is what it is. And then he would give the guy a, an Irish history lesson. And then the, the 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 interview would be right out the door. Beforehand, I would preempt the district. I can say, listen, why don't you kind of steer clear of any Irish questions, right? Or names or anything like that, because Phil will let you know. And, and, then, and then the interview started to go the way they were supposed to go, right? Yeah. But he... Still was fiercely Irish, so I think that Gary is just in his DNA, the whole you know Irish way of uh, the the musical storytelling. Well, whiskey, whiskey it in the jar was the first Irish. single. Although, can we just point out, by the way, um, that that my hair again? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep coming back to that. Um, <laughs> what's your regime? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, conditioning is always good. <laughs> no, is that. The first song on the first album that you do with Thin Lizzy, you wrote. I did. 
I, I did. We were in uh, rehearsal for the uh, first album, the Nightlife album, and I'd had this riff for a little while. Phil looks up and said, "What's that?" You know, and I said, uh, "Well, it's a it's this riff I've been been working on." He goes, well, "You got any more to it?" And I said, "Yeah," and I <clears throat> played him, you know, the you know the next bit and the next bit. And then he started to play too. Then, then uh, Downey got on it, and it, and it became a full blown song, right? Which I thought was so cool. I mean, I, here I am. It's you know the first album I've ever recorded in my life. The first song I ever wrote with Phil Lynott. Fantastic. And it becomes the opening track on that album, right? It just kind of doesn't get any better than that. Did it's Phil no, very- Did Phil normally bring the songs in complete and play them to the band on I guitar always- or what? <laughs> Yeah, not not all. We we did a lot of writing on acoustic guitars, right? And uh, in his living room. And you know, sometimes he goes, "I got I got the whole thing mapped out. If you want to add anything, great." You know, but or then he would say, "I got this riff," you know. So we're gonna have to take it from there, you know. Or or I got this lyric line, you know. Uh, here's this line for this lyric, you know. What kind of music can we put to that, right? Well, let me think about this for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was never really one way or the other there was just there was always a different way of writing songs and and listening and i think that's why the albums they never really kept to any kind of single form diverse if you know a lot of uh, bands that you listen to you can tell it's a blah 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 album or a blah 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 song i think with, with thin lizzy a lot of the times because each track is so different from the last one that uh, I I, want to say there's not a lot of coordination, but I think that's the wrong, wrong word. Uh, Continuity. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. We'll we'll go with that. But I think in a way that's kind of what led to Liz's success, you know, because that diversity, that the fact that you guys weren't scared of putting your foot into pop music. Of, of of chilling everything well, down, of using synthesizers at other points, and or, yeah, or, yeah, and, I've, and, I've, but, and buddying up to the Sex Pistols. Yeah, yeah there yeah. you go. Yeah. Okay, you want to talk about the Sex Pistols? Come on, let's go. Oh, ah. what you want to? <laughs> well, I do want to talk. Oh, come on, I come saw. On. <laughs> I watched a clip of the Greedy Bastards uh, on YouTube. Oh my God! Listen, this is the guitar lineup. It, Chris Spedding on his Flying yeah. V. You know, right. you and Brian, Gary Moore. Gary, yeah. Gary, I mean, that's, yeah. it's just, and, and Phil doing his thing. I mean, what? Yeah, and Paul, Paul on Paul drums, drums along, with, well, along with Brian Downey, you know. That was, I can't tell you how much fun that thing was, right? And so if Chris Betting was in the band, everybody had to learn three Chris Betting songs. Uh, Geldof, when he was with us, we had to learn five or three Boomtown Rat songs. Uh, every anybody else who came, you had to learn three of their songs, right? So what that did, it, it immediately took you out of your bubble, right, and put it into their bubble, right? You know, you were kind of wearing their shoes for three songs to see what it was like to play their songs, right, or what it took to, you know, to play. What pistol songs, songs so, did you do? Pretty vacant. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. But uh, you na- name me a couple. Pretty vacant, Pretty absolutely. Vacant, yeah. God save the Pretty queen. Vacant, God save the queen. Yeah, uh, I bodies, think that submission. Yeah, they're fun songs to play. <laughs> anyway, they're great songs and to play, and they're not. They're, they, you know, when you listen to them, you think, "Well, they're like three chord songs." They, actually, they're not. No, they're not. No, but there's. A, but it's a very brilliant thing that just the fact of anyone who was a rock band before punk had that awful thing of that fence coming down, and this was such a brilliant <laughs> thing of of you know because you so deserve to be part of the modern world. It was such a brilliant way of of like you know crossing over that threshold it's funny that just to tie this into my own personal uh, anecdotes it's oh, the first course. time i ever saw <laughs> phil linnett i'd walked right. i was i'd been invited by mid to good earth tony visconti's studio uh and good earth yeah that's right 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 yeah yeah and yeah. in soho uh yeah. to listen to uh visage to listen to tar and f- I think Fade to Grey, actually, but it was Tar. So it was the first time Midge was producing, uh, st- st- you know, Steve Strange and um, and, and Rusty Egan's band. And, uh, right. and I, I walked into the toilet and out of a cubicle fell Phil Linnett and Steve Jones. <laughs> <laughs> and I, they're right on top of me. And obviously, com- 
<laughs> completely, you know, wanting to talk, I think is so... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Animated. Animated. And, and <laughs> Phil used to go, because we used to go to this club called The Blitz, that, which, uh, every, you know... Well, right. Club for Heroes yeah, was God. Phil's hand, and wasn't Phil, he? Phil was came to The time. Blitz. Phil was there, you know. I oh, mean, right. he was a huge... And I saw that transition, you know. He'd obviously, you know, he was suddenly wearing clothes that were kind of like New Romantic, and he was beginning to go that way. Right. Um, he kind of made the switch there for a while, didn't he? He did. He rocked the skinny tie, I must say. Oh, uh, God, yeah. 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 I think he invented that. You know? <laughs> well, um, so you went... Did you, guys ever, did you guys ever go to the speakeasy? No. I didn't go before, to the speakeasy. Before, I was before too my kind of young to very go great. to the speakeasy. Very yeah. cool club, man. Yeah. You know, anyway. That shut us up. Um, yeah, it did. <laughs> Actually, we, we, met, we met the uh, Sex Pistols at Good Earth Studio. Oh, there. really? They just came down one day. I think Phil invited them down. They came down, and I think they were. I think they were listening to the the Life in Dangerous album. I want to say right. But uh, Phil comes up with this. He goes, "Hey man, you know we have to do a Christmas single." And I'm like, "Really? <laughs> us, us and the Sex Pistols, man, it'd be great, right?" And Steve Jones goes, "Yeah, I got a riff." I'm going, "Wow, this is really getting out of control here." Okay. <laughs> So you t- we got you didn't have to cut we, everything's head. all set up anyway, right? It's all set up, and we go out with all strap on, and, and Steve's going, okay, well this is the riff, you know, and, uh, and and Phil says, well, okay, and here's the lyrics. I'll, we'll do the Merry Christmas thing, and uh, here's the bridge in the middle eight, blah blah blah, and the whole thing was written like in forty five minutes, and it took us another hour to record it, right? So it was all done written recorded everything in an hour and 45 minutes that's not how visconti tells it <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no four hours but, but here's the kicker six weeks later we're up on top of the pops playing this thing because now it's a hit <laughs> I'm going really yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> jimmy savile was there that day and steve jones would not let up on jimmy savile oh my god all right we got that was, right yeah, at that point i didn't know what he was talking about it was that case like, Dirty scumbag! I'm going really. Doesn't he work for a lot of charities and all that? Go charities, my ass. Really? He would not let Steve up. Could tell. Stop he said, "Yeah, thing. yeah." Steve could say, oh um, my God. He could spot a nonce a Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> Boys are back in town, man. I mean, that is not a bunch of heavy metal chords, right? No. I mean, you know, a lot I'm, of minor chords I'm detecting F sharp minor seven sus four. You know, stuff that right. is like really yeah, it's unusual. It's practically right. Cole Porter. <laughs> <laughs> but that whole album, you know, that the jailbreak album, I mean, it, is this that you're in your pomp at this point? You mean at our peak? Uh, is that what you mean? This is some of the best songs that you, you, you'd ever, you guys had ever come up with, I yeah. feel. Up to that point, I will definitely agree. Uh, musically, definitely not. Uh, we all became way way better at what we were doing you know a couple of years down the yeah, road yeah, yeah. right but it, it was the jailbreak album that, kind of, that definitely sent us yeah, I mean, on bad our way. reputation has you know i mean incredible yeah. stuff too but one because the thing i'll say i remember because this whole thing like we were saying earlier about live albums <clears throat> is that what used to happen to me after seeing you guys was you'd go and see a band live you go oh my god they're amazing and then you go and get the album and we'd be like oh yeah, yeah but, it, and jailbreak absolutely didn't do that I remember, oh, okay. I remember youth and I, I think he bought it, you know, you, you know, you had to pick right. what albums you could afford and he bought it and we had it back at school and I remember putting on it and, and it was there. It was that band we saw. Okay. You know, well, was, thank uh, you for that. I thought yeah. you were going to kick my no, ass. No, just, just tell, tell, us, tell us about Boys Are Back In Town. I really just want to know how this thing came together or how you first heard it, what, what you remember of it. Well, Phil already had the, pretty much the lyrics uh, done and dusted, right? And he had this really simple bass line, ding, 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 you know. He goes, what do you think? And I went, it sounds like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do I think, you know? <clears throat> and he goes, well, you know, so, you know, let's, let's start putting some more chords to it and all like Because I really think, oh, you know, I've got something lyrically here, right? So, you know, we started working on it. And we, we demoed it. So basically what we were listening back to was just the chord patterns. And... Phil singing along to it. And this right? very, very Irish timing, that digga 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 digga, that 12A. I'll give you that. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll give you that. So 
we brought the manager down and we had I think, 15 songs and we could only record 10, pick the 10 that we thought were going to be the ones. Right. And in that 10, the boys are back in town was not on that list. Right. And now Chris O'Donnell, one of the managers came in, he listened and he says, so this boys are back in town. Now, why didn't you put that on the list? And we were pretty much like, well, we just thought one of the other ones was maybe a little better. Like I, like I said, this is before all the harmony guitars got put on. Because now there's there's something about this song I, that, that really clicks. You know, I, I think you need to include that on the album. Okay, you know, that's somebody that there's a vote for, for that song from somebody. Okay, we'll, we'll put that on the album. And that's when we started to uh, uh, work on the harmonies, right? Uh, we started, you know, honing in on not just that one, but all the songs, all the different harmonies and all that, right? And I remember Phil said, you know, we need something in here. It should go something like da 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 da. It didn't make any sense at all, especially like you were saying the twelve eight timing and all that. And I listened to what Brian Downey was playing, and, and to me, it had more of a rolling kind of thing. Right, do la da, and 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 that's when Bravo came in and said, "Do la da 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 da." I went, "That's it. That's that's the one. Let's put the harmony to that." And that's how that whole section came about. You know, the, the harmony guitars, and it was actually Phil who said, "You know, we needed an ascending uh, at the end of the song. The guitar should ascend, you know, into the heavens, kind of thing." So we kept going up the scale and up the scale and, until we. Ended where we ended. Oh my god! See, here's the thing: as a bass player, to me, the actually the hook is diddle ding da ding ding. Oh, oh yeah, that lick yeah, is, that yeah. Lick that is feels so great. Yeah, yeah, diddle well, ding da ding. ding. You, yeah, I, I, I will agree with you. As soon as you hear, <laughs> you know what song. Yeah, it's, but this is there, there's no this doubt is, about this is, that. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that one. This <laughs> is the skill of this song. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a few here. Why this is? <laughs> you are. Why you're getting your licks? Too. That's all I can recall. <laughs> 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 Why this song is so good as well. That opening line. Guess who's just got back today? I mean, it's immediately right. asking a question of the listener. It's engaging you right. in a piece of intimate gossip. I mean... Right. <sighs> like, like he's talking to it's you. It's going to be right? one of the best opening lines to any pop song ever written. <laughs> cool. And that's where yeah. Phil is really on his own here. Because the storytelling... I suppose there's people like maybe Costello, Graham Parker you know bruce at his best you know where, where that had that ability but there's something this is the the irish guy in the bar isn't it who's gonna but tell it's exactly you exactly what it is i'm saying phil always sounds like he's telling you a story and a lot of them they're always kind of like dashiell hammock sort of yeah. you know marlow type type stories mm. but it was that thing because fine, we were driving around listening to it by the way i listened to boys back in town with my missus who's who's a children's author and she was just saying <laughs> these lyrics are absolutely amazing. Her favorite line in the song is, if the boys want to fight, you better let them. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but also on jailbreak, Phil's not saying there's a jailbreak going on. He's saying tonight there's going to be a jailbreak. You know, it's another bit of letting the audience into Somewhere something. Somewhere in this I know, town. And, and, I know, and I know you. this obviously this comes up all the time. I'm right. going to say something in defense of Phil here, because, yeah, we've all done it. There's, uh, tonight's okay. going to be a jailbreak somewhere in this town. Frankly, I'm not a betting man, but my money's on the jail. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but could, it be, yeah. could it be that the town has more than one jail? I'm thinking that you're right. Yeah. I that's what he was thinking. That's what he was trying to get over to everybody. There's more than one. Or it, or it was a mobile jail. <laughs> also, there's that other line that really throws you when he says, looking right and looking left, um, which is obviously to make the line because it, it feels like it should be looking left and looking right. I don't know, that's because I grew up with the Green Cross Code. How, how, dare, how dare you turn these lyrics into some kind of Guy Pratt joke? <laughs> Public I'm fu I'm furious. <laughs> <laughs> I, did an I, I did an interview with a, a German journalist one day, right? And he thought he had the boys are back in town. He thought he thought he knew exactly what Phil was talking about, right? And I said, okay, well, so what's your theory? What this song's all about? He goes, well, it's got to all it has to do with the IRA. And I went, well, okay, oh. right there. <laughs> I said, have you actually have you actually listened to the lyrics? It's a bunch of your buddies getting together and getting drunk and getting into fights and picking up chicks and having a great Saturday night. IRA? What are you talking about? 
Uh, All right. I, I, I wanted to just ask you about when you did the Rod Stewart TV show, which I read today. I oh, didn't even know Rod no, Stewart had a TV show. Did you, Guy? I did not know Rod Stewart had a TV show. Uh, it wasn't. It, I think it was a special. And, and you guys were on it. <laughs> it, was like, it wasn't like a weekly show. I think you upset I, Rod. I think it was a special. that. He, well, no, you, a couple of years after we did that. Because at that point, Rod was the, the stand standalone singer guy, right? No band behind him at all. And a few years after that, he came up to Phil and said, you know, you guys are the reasons that I went out and got the band again. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did. He just did not feel comfortable sitting up there by himself, you know, and I don't blame I, him. I read he was upset because he, he was miming and you guys were singing live on the show and uh, he, th he didn't realize oh, that was happening. That, that could be. Phil refused to mime. Absolutely refused to do it. If you, if you go back to any uh, Top of the Pops uh, shows that we did, you know, he's the guy that's singing live every time. Oh, wow. he, he refused to mime. While we're on this stuff, Henry Rollins. God, I love Henry. Yeah, what did you do with him? I, cause I couldn't find it. I just found that you worked with him. Well, we did a... Uh, it was like, I think, of the 10th anniversary of, of Phil's death, right? And I wanted to do something, right? So... What we did, we put together a, a show in Dublin with a lot of different bands, they, they, just Irish bands, right? And we, we got a lot of people up there, you know, playing on certain songs with uh, me and John Sykes and Brian Dunn. And unbeknownst to me, Mr. Rollins had flown over by himself uh, from New York saying that he wanted to get up on the stage with us, right? Now, I didn't know who Henry Rollins was, right? But everybody was scared to yeah. death with because he's, he's got, a beast. He's yeah. got the, you know, the, the shaved head. He's got tattoos he's all ripped. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he's got this <laughs> attitude, right? And everybody's scared to death to talk to him, right? I went, and that started to frighten me a little bit. Like, wow, should I be working <laughs> for this guy? You know, I said, I tell you, uh, I, so I called him up in his room and I said, hey, why don't we <clears throat> meet down in the lobby just so there's like some. Some public down there, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's witnesses when case, your head right? comes off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we meet up, and it, within five minutes, literally five minutes, man, I fell in love with this guy. He was the sweetest guy, one of the sweetest guys you could act and ever meet. A really astute, really intelligent, right? And I kept thinking, why is everybody afraid of this guy? You know. And it's purely don't judge a book by its cover mm -hmm. kind of thing, right? Yeah, no, he's super bright. There's no question of that. Yeah, and, and I said, well, what song do you want to do, right? And uh, you, you kind of caught me on the hop here. I can't remember right, right. What, what song he did, right? But he gets up on, on the stage. He starts singing, and, man, he's just like whirlwind all over the stage, right? <laughs> just, he's just having a great time, but he's... He did say something, and I never really caught what it was. And the audience started to boo him, right? And I just was, I just did that. No, 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 no that's not on. No, no way, right? And I think Henry felt a little bit, you know, miffed at that, and rightly so, right? But he did a great job, you know. And he had, a, had such a great time, and the energy that he brought on that stage mm -hmm. was phenomenal. Okay, right? so so this was a Lizzie-related thing. It wasn't you going and doing something with him. No, no, no. It was like a, we got a little reunion together in Dublin. There. After, after, I wanted to talk about some of the other guitar players you've, you've played with in the band. Because obviously, uh -oh. obviously, Ro Robbo got in, got in a bit of a fight uh, just after, before, before the, I think it was the Johnny the Fox album tour and cut his hat. Yeah, we were going to go out with Queen. And um, it was over Frankie Miller or something. Someone insulted. Well, he and Frankie went to the speakeasy that I just mentioned here, right? The night before, <laughs> we were supposed to go on this massive American tour with Queen, right? And as you are when you're drunk, I guess, you know, once somebody says something to somebody and then somebody retaliates and some guy picked up a bottle and was ready to smash it over Frankie's head and Brian lifted up his hand to try to deflect it and the bottle broke on his hand and, it, you know, it cut his tendon right there and that was him done. Oh, he was wow. uh, off the tour, right? So it's like, well, what the hell do we do now? Do we just tell him we can't go? And <clears throat> once again, Phil goes, hell no, I know a guy. And he calls up Gary, right? And Gary, when 
bang, straight in and took up the reins. And it was fun. How was it like playing with Gary? Great. It, it, it really was. He constantly surprised me with the, you know, the, the different styles that he could come oh, up yeah, with. Oh, yeah, it's not. I'm, I've recorded and toured with Gary. It's, he's, yeah, it's insane. The dexterity. Yeah. The dexterity that guy yeah. had. He was doing things way back when that nobody could do. That people are still trying to figure out today. Mm-hmm. Joe, I know Joe Bonamassa has studied uh, uh, Gary Moore. He had to. Well, it, I mean, yeah. it's almost like the same exact style. And it all comes out of the sort of Peter Green school, really, I suppose. But 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 yeah. Gary was adding the sort of more um, uh, flowery stuff that came from Irish music. You know, there was that element in there yeah. in there too. And Gary did love Peter Green. Uh, in fact, Peter. Well, Green, he, he, yeah, he had he had the Les Paul. Yeah. And I think uh, your your man from uh, uh, Metallica has now. Uh, that's yeah. right. That's right. Were you guitar player? What's his I name? I forgot. H- Hamnet. Kirk Hamnet. Yeah. Hamnet. Were you? That's were, it. God, were, he's going to kill me if he's. It's funny because the bass player has got Jacko's bass. I love. Oh, is that so, right? Yes. Yeah, so guys, guys are, I love that the guy yeah. from Spandau Ballet knew that, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm right, right. Um, hey, guy, did, did you did you ever see Jacko live? No, I didn't. I didn't. Wow. No. Phil turned me on to, uh, we saw him in uh, Seattle uh, at this theater that we're playing in. They were on, the weather report were on the night before. He goes, wait till you see this bass player. It's just going to pull your head straight off. And he did. Yeah. I, you could do things like that on bass. You know, it was just. You un- can't, you can't, frankly. It, you know what it, I mean? You can't. Right? <laughs> well, un- were un- you, you know, so I became a fan straight Scott, up. were you ever, did you ever feel threatened? by the other guitarist, you know? Was there ever a moment of like, shit, you know, I've got to up my game here, or he might- Oh, that was constant. I got to up my game. Oh, that, that was a constant thing, but- and- <clears throat> or, or conversely, was it like, oh, it's this guy, if I can relax. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank God we got him in the yeah. band. No, uh, uh, to me, uh, being at Thinalicity was, and I hate to use this word, but it was a constant learning journey for me. Uh, a- after having so little uh, playing ex- experience coming in from Glendale, I was constantly learning from everybody that got up on stage with us, right? So for me, it was like a master class, you know, being up on the stage with, uh, with, with some of these guys, right? And, and you, you learn how to steal, but steal in the correct way that nobody knows you're doing it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right and applying it to your own style kind of, kind of thing you know you're you know you're learning the whole time I, I, uh, go on. I always say to everybody never never feel threatened when, when you come up uh, against somebody who, who you know is better than you or you feel that is better than you what you gotta do you have to learn from these people you know because if you don't you're a fool but wouldn't you say that there's a, i mean not unique amongst instruments but because of where it is that that lead guitarists are by their nature competitive. Well, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there is ego there, absolutely. Oh, hey, check this out. Can you do that? You know? And there can't. There aren't many bands with two lead guitarists. I mean, I suppose there's Blue Oyster Cult have three, I suppose, but you know, there, there aren't many. I got a I got a text from Midjour today talking about you. And you, his okay. quote is, the rock that held it all together, the one guitarist who stood the test of time. Ah, that's Because he played with yeah. Midge. Midge played with Ben Lizzie. Midge, 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 Midge is great. He's really great. When, uh, when Gary uh, absconded uh, during uh, halfway through an American tour, uh, Phil says, Let, let's get Midge in, right? And I went, what? He's a, he's a keyboard player for God's sake. Goes, no, no, no. He, he plays guitar too. And he plays really well. You know, and, does he know the song? Yeah, yeah. He's, and he didn't, right? Uh, so what we did is we uh, we got him and, and said, okay, here's your plane ticket. And, and Mitch is thinking the whole time, well, you know, it's, it's an eight hour flight. I've got my cassette player. I'll get the headphones on, make a bunch of notes. And you know, learn a lot of the things that uh, that he didn't quite know before, right? But he didn't realize that we'd put him on Concord, and he was <laughs> <laughs> he was in New York in three hours, right? <laughs> Oops! But as soon as he got into time, I think the first show we did was uh, New Orleans, and I went straight up to his hotel room with my guitar, and we just furiously started, yeah, beat him to death, right? 
But, you know, we started where, okay, you do that part. I'd say about your harmony lines that blah, blah, blah. we just kind of map things out, you know, really quickly. And I said, honestly, if there's a bit that you uh, don't know or you've forgotten, you just hang out and just, just play the chords and then we'll work on it tomorrow. Right. And, and that's, that's how we worked. It. And he did great. Uh, and then and, and then Snowy White came in. You played with Snowy, didn't you, guy? No, no, no. He was the other camp. So you, oh, uh, you never played with Snow with Pink never Floyd. With Stone. No, of course. Yes. No. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> well, I, I knew. That's where I knew um, Snow uh, from. Is uh, Phil and I went to a Pink Floyd concert in New York, right? And oh, uh, you know, Gilmore's up there playing, playing as amazing as he always does. But in this one section of the song, the spotlight <clears throat> hit this guy. Right, who played this incredible guitar solo? And I turned around to Phil and went, "Who the hell is that?" Right, and Phil just shrugged. You know, I, I don't know. I don't have any idea. Right. So we went backstage and I clocked him, and I still didn't know what his name at, at this point. I stuck my hand out to hold my name, and he goes, "Yeah, I'm I'm Snowy White." I thought, wow, it's a it's a name you can't forget, Snowy yeah. White. So the next time I saw Snowy was uh, at a Cliff Richard rehearsal, what? right? Because I'd gotten a friend of mine the keyboard gig with Cliff Richards, right? And who's on the stage with him is Snowy White. So I hung around uh, until he took a break, and we were holding some auditions, this open end audition that we only did one time, and we never did it again. I don't recommend that for anybody. Well, but, except for when you got the gig, that's how they. <laughs> well, no, no, but that wasn't an open ended. You know, yeah, this, right, right. We had like like twenty guitar players or you know, wrapped around this little theater thing, right? But uh, I said to Snow, I said, you know, you got a bunch of people on your plan. You know, I, I know that you know if you could, can you just come down and give give us a break and just come down and just play some guitar with us and you know just some blues stuff. He went, yeah, sure, no problem. And he came down after uh, the Cliff Richards rehearsal and got up on stage and just played some really great stuff. And Phil and I looked at each other and went, I, I think this is the guy, you know? But again, and, he's a real Peter Green blues purist. Well, he had a and, Peter Green. And, you're, and again, you're yeah. right. Yeah. You know, there's the left hook, you know, and you've got the upper cut. <laughs> hook there going. We, so. we, should, uh, <laughs> we should just talk about the ending of, you know, your final concerts and uh, that, I mean, because the band split before Phil died. As far as yeah. I know, and and I, I, what yeah. was was what was the problem that brought that on? Well, you know, it's kind of well known. We were we had drug problems mm -hmm. in, in the band, right? and uh, it, and the drugs were getting pretty nasty to the point where you would hear, say, like a live recording, somebody would bring in, and it would sound terrible, right? And that really got to me and I said to Phil I said you know at some point we're going to have to kind of walk away from this whole thing you know if for nothing else just to keep the reputation up and running right and he just at that point he just would not hear of it. that's not going to happen not in a million years is that going to happen and then he heard a recording that was just a total freaking train wreck right and then he said, well, you might have some merit here. You know, you, you might, you might be right, you know? And so we started to talk about it. <clears throat> we got to, but then he goes, he goes, well, I tell you what, we'll do, we'll do one last album and then we'll do one last world tour <laughs> and, and then we'll knock it on the head. Right. So I was walking into his house thinking I was going to go out with, shaking hands and all that. So now I've just agreed to a, another <laughs> album. And <laughs> was that Thunder and Lightning? Which, which, which was fine. It was a tough tour to do. But. Right. Uh, the farewell show, was that advertised farewell show? Everyone knows that's it. This is the last show. I, I think everybody knew anyway. Because mm -hmm. uh, it was in Germany at the, at the Nuremberg Festival. <clears throat> that was going to be our last, wow. our last show ever. And it, it was really a cool tribute every band that was on that bill came and stood on the stage with us, you know, and, and, you know, clapped along and sang to the songs and all that. And it was, it was really moving, you know, I, you know, it was the last song. And, oh, um, it was probably me and the boys were wondering where you and the girl, what, what you and the girls were doing tonight. <laughs> yeah. 
Phil going at 36. Fucking hell, I can't believe he was 36. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. given so much and we still see him as an icon. You know, he, he's up there. He's up there, isn't he? As far as, you know, we're concerned with, with, with Hendrix and yeah. all those people who have yeah. gone. Keith Moore. We're all twice as old as when, than when he died. You know, that's... Wow, yeah. A little bit, you know? Yeah, he still had a he still had a lot in him too. Yeah, he still had a oh, lot. Oh, definitely, yeah. Way, way too young for that to happen. So it's a shame. I miss him all the time. I know a lot of people out there miss him all the time too. So you know, as as long as that happens and people miss him, then you know, hopefully the Thin Lizzy name will stay up in lights a little little longer. I found out. Oh, definitely, no question. Uh, guy, uh, did you did you <laughs> yeah. find out this? I I saw this today and I I didn't I didn't know it, but the the guy jim fitzpatrick who designed oh, yeah. the logo for thin lizzie which we all know right do you know what else he designed mm. go on red and black che guevara poster wow yeah which is like iconic every middle class house had that up on their wall at some point in the late 60s right you know? right. yeah right. we actually have a, a whiskey coming out a whiskey and a rum coming out that has jim's uh well it's the uh Johnny the Fox album cover, and the other one is the Black Rose album cover on it, and they they just look stunning. Amazing, absolutely stunning. Uh, it's, it's, isn't Johnny the Fox a pub in outside Dublin somewhere? There is. Did you know that? Uh, it, it actually is. Yeah, <laughs> it's up on the hill, up in the Wicklow Mountains, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I'd, I'd almost forgotten that. But you're absolutely. I remember going there, but back in the eighties when I when I was living in Dublin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Scott, thank you so much. Yeah, it's so good to see you, man. It was you too. Um, and listen, and listen, yeah. and I would love to make it up and and come and play sometime. I would love that. I'd... You both, of you guys are invited. Oh. It, it, <laughs> you know, you know, like if if you see us on tour and all that, guys, and, and you want to come, just get a hold of me. You know, and I'll slam you. Well, we'll do. We'll have a, we'll have a couple of beers backstage. Yeah. I mean, I think I think guy guy would like to bring his bass. That's what he's really saying. He wants to <laughs> yeah. he wants to join that queue going around the block. Robbie Crane is our bass player, and he would have no problem oh, with. Oh, no, fantastic, man! With your reputation, hell no. Scott, what a pleasure to really? meet you. Thank you so much. Really? So lovely hey, to see you, man. Really lovely thank to see you, man. Guy. Lots of love. Really, it's such a pleasure to meet you guys. Guy, I didn't want that one to end. I know, I know. He's 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 got such a lovely turn of phrase, just so charming. And he's that guy, and he looks like Clint Eastwood oh, when you actually just mate. sat there looking at. He's him, a handsome he? boy, isn't he? Still, he's a handsome boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and what and what a player! I really want to go. Whatever they're doing, we'll, we'll make it absolutely. A, a, yeah, another outing. Do you want to say the thank yeah. yous today? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes, I'll say the thank yous. Oh, sorry. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to Ben, our producer. Uh, and to everyone for listening and please keep subscribing and signing up and thank you back to Scott yes yeah, so I've got to go because my wife's had a bunion operation a double bunion operation and, and I bet she loves you talking about that to all of our listeners <laughs> <laughs> so goddamn sexy, isn't it? You know. But anyway, poor thing. She's downstairs on yeah. and 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 I've got to go down and and feed the children. <laughs> There's no way to I end a rock on tours, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but we just did. It's good night from me, <laughs> and it's good night from them. Rock on tours is produced by Gimme Sugar Productions for Warner Music Group UK.